Hey folks, welcome back to this next video in this series on pre-training LLMs. So right now, uh, I have the, um, the Olmo code pulled up. And the purpose of this video is go over the model class, like how they set up the model. And of course, um, it is hard to... Um, delve into the specifics, but if you see something that you don't understand, uh, please go check it out in YouTube. Um, I'm sure there are like plenty of videos. I will just briefly touch upon rope and the other things. Uh, and I'm sure you can find some details about those, uh, like what is rope, why is rope used and those kind of things. So this is just an overview of what how this team built up the model class. And, um, and it's actually pretty straightforward because PyTorch is uh, kind of self-explaining and they've written a nice code. And a lot of it is pretty much a rather straight up hugging face implementation. So I am, so inside the GitHub directory, there is this Olmo folder and inside it, there is this models.py file. Uh, this is the one that I will be reviewing. So they begin with importing and um, while we review, let me also keep a track of all the, uh, let's see, In, okay, of all the layers that we have in here, right, this is going to be useful. So first, a um, bunch of imports. I never don't care what they are. Um, we'll get to those. So what these are in a bit. First, we go to our um, the very first layer, which is the dropout, which is just defined as the dropout um, function. Then layer norm. It's from um, from the previous video, we saw that these guys implemented a parameter free layer norm. However, when you're uh, when you're starting to train a model, you don't know what choices you're going to make. So you tend to define generic functions that, that cover all the different options. And then later you will uh, define or you will go with a particular one. So here they define a base class for layer norm that can do both parameter wise and the non-parameter dependent. And this is how they set it up. And um, they, this is an abstract method and the forward method will be implemented by the child classes or classes that inherit from it. Um, so, so this was just a base, which, and here what we see is the kind of layer norm that they will do. So either, um, it will be layer norm low precision, the default precision, or they can do the RMS layer norm that Llama uses. Okay, so let's go to the layer norm class, which again inherits from layer norm base. And this is where the forward is defined. Um, the reason why forward wasn't a part of that is they wanted to uh, casting uh, themselves. So the downcast and then apply layer norm. Um, so that's just a new medical stability thing to, to lower the precision. And this um, gives them the option of like uh, reducing precision. Like in, they only need to define one forward class depending on whether we have the low precision version of layer norm or the default version, we can do both. That's the advantage. Um, then they define the RMS norm as well, and so on. So one thing to note is every time you see, excuse me, every time you see Torch Autocast, that means um, this is doing mixed precision. So let me pull up the documentation. So Autocast is used for any, um, So here the autocast should only wrap forward passes. Um, and um, 
it basically does the computation in the type that you selected the mix precision as defined by CUDA. I'm not sure, I, I'm not completely aware of the inner workings of Autocast. Uh, there are a bunch of blogs that, that talk about it, but um, um, there are, I, I think this, this, docu uh, this documentation is self-explanatory on um, if you set Autocast a D type to be a certain one, what are the different operations that go in that and what are left in uh, floating point 32. But that's not the point. We will, um, uh, there's no need to delve into it just yet. So, uh, so that was layer norm. Then these people have, um, so they use the rotatory embedding, which is what pretty much every LLM nowadays uses. And um, this implementation is a pretty simple, straightforward implementation of rope that you see pretty much seen all hugging face models. I won't go. I won't go into the details, but I would like to point all of you to this nice blog written by uh, the LabML AI guys, where they walk through a similar code of how rotatory embedding is generated, and they explain what different things are doing, what different pieces of codes are doing, or lines of code. So the idea behind rope is you take, so each token has a position embedding. And the way they define the position embedding is for each token, now it has like D dimensions, you take the two, two of the dimensions and you rotate it in uh, in this space. Well, you rotate it pretty much mapping it to complex space. That's why this rotation comes. Uh, that's that's where this whole TD, uh, 2D plane uh, comes. And um, uh, so you're in this X1 and X2 dimensional space. That's where you perform the rotation. And the idea why you do this rotation is that now if you have, let's say, um, for these two uh, X1 and X2, note these are the... the indices of your embedding. So D dimension embedding, we're looking at the first two indices for the same token. So if a token is at mth position versus a token as nth position, once you compute the, uh, the inner product, you see, you will see that inner product depends on the M minus one. So, so this is the relative position embedding. So this is the kind of property you want. And that's why this mapping is good. Uh, in general, what people do instead of doing adjacent indices, they'll do indices that are d over 2 apart. So what I mean here is i and i plus d over 2, kind of. So 1 and 50, 2 and 51, 3 and 52 for, for d that is equal to 100. Um, yeah, so this is just a, like efficient way to, to, uh, to do that rotatory embedding. And... Um, the way rotatory embedding is applied is we apply this to um, so we we would get a rotatory embedding matrix for the queries and the keys and we multiply uh, the this, this matrix to the queries and keys um, what i meant here was um, your standard query times key would become a rotated version with this rotation matrix um, acting over the queries and the key matrices. Uh, this is from the Roformer paper, which introduced rotatory embedding. Um, let's go back. So this function get rotatory embedding uh, generates the embeddings and um, uh, right, so you get the sines and the cosines, and um, this is the interesting thing. You can apply the rotatory embeddings to a tensor by passing the sines and the cosines. So what they also have is a forward function which takes in the query and the key matrices and depending on the precision, converts them. And what we basically do is obtain the rotatory embeddings, and then we apply the rotatory embeddings to both Q and K, 
and then basically those values are returned um why are we applying um the yeah this bit i'm not sure i understand why we are taking indices um only those indices uh, but yeah so well, we'll have to just loop through uh, because all there are so many implementations of these rotatory embeddings and everyone is so different i only know very well the lab ml one because that's used in the logging face models as well anything else i'll just have to like work through the math but i'm sure they're all equivalent um then they define this activation class where they have you know, again we want to try all the different activations so they have gelu relu and swiglu eventually they'll use swiglu but let's see how swiglu works so what swiglu does is um it applies this swiglu function and then multiplies that by x. So first we chunk um, chunk our tensor. So I'm not completely sure what chunking is, but let's say, so here I have, um, so let's say I created this tensor and if I do, um, actually let me make it a multi-dimensional. Now today I can't type. So my A is a three by three matrix and let's chunk it. Um, and what does chunking require? Chunks along, let's, uh, if I say dimension zero, let's see what it does. Um, okay. It converted into two chunks going to around this dimension, and I think the result will be the same. I mean, there will be two chunks. But if I had it being uh, an even matrix, I think the chunks would be um, similar shaped. So yeah, okay. So it just splits. I guess that's what torch chunking does. right okay splits um so pretty standard um interesting okay so what we're we doing is in the forward method um we split x into two chunks about the last dimension and then we apply silo and then multiply so the last dimension i'll have to um, as we go through the the forward pass we'll soon see what the last dimension is so let's park this for now um then they have a function for the causal attention masks. Um, they, they also try the alibi attention. And then finally, we are in the base class for the transformer implementation. So this base class has um, the, I guess everything is initialized from a model config talk about what that is later but um, um you basically define everything so your dropouts your k and q norms um what kind of um well whether your kqv is uh, qkv is clipped or not what kind of um activation you want your attention the linear layers and so on whether you want flash attention or not which is a more efficient version of implementation and then how do you um, initialize parameters um, 
and then whether you have activation checkpointing enabled uh, coming from FSTP, whether um, do you want to uh, checkpoint and um, and also we have a scale dot product attention. So what scale dot product attention is basically uh, this is a nice watch function. That does the whole entire KQV uh, product. So it computes scale dot production uh, query key, and it can also use an attention mask if needed. And um, okay, so so basically this is what um, this is the Pythonic implementation of what it is doing in the background. You can take a look, but um, this computes your attentions attention and and whatnot let's see what the returns are it returns attention output and um, the shapes are batch size sequence um, the output sequence embedding dimension um, and embedding dimension of the value okay that pretty much makes sense um so just so that we um, know how it works i'll try this piece in the notebook so we have a query uh that is 32 um i guess i need to import this f so hmm. where does this actually live um oh i'll show it oh, yeah that's silly Right, so I don't care about it, but I care about the shape. So if my query matrix is um, 32 by 8 by 128 by 64, what that means is the batch size is 32. Let's go back. My batch size is 32. The dimensions are the second dimensions are my sequence length so my sequence length is eight and um the 128 and 64 correspond to um embedding dimensions and uh so so the last one is the embedding dimension and Wait, am I missing something? Yeah, so uh, one of them would be the the hidden dimensions, and the other would be um, the number of heads. So uh, the large number of heads threw me off. But again, this could be the number of heads. This would be sequence. You know, it it all can be permuted. Uh, but this takes it in a particular order, and we only care about that. So so what this would do is query dot key get the attention values, the normalized attention values, um, multiply them, uh, combine them with the values, and finally the output would be also the same dimensions. So this is basically how uh, scale dot product attention works, um, and yeah, so so this function pretty much returns the same. So yeah, so as you see, this is what it, they're doing. So they're they're transposing the dimensions because um, you want to compute it per head. So uh, that, that makes sense. Um, then they do this weird thing um, where they repeat K multiple K and V multiple times is because um, there is no native grouped query attention support in grouped query attention 
uh, the queries are grouped together. The, so let's say you had eight heads, um, you will have eight queries, but your keys and values will be grouped together. So there might be like only four of keys and values for the eight heads uh, for each. Like, so for every two heads, you will have just one key and one value. Um, so, so this is a way to, to still get uh, SDPA to work if for group query attention, but um, this is a hacky way. Um, okay, so so this is how they compute attention. So first of all, um, you give it QKV. You um, will won't worry about cache and the layer past. Um, so this is first first um, the input Q ha would have the shape of um, your bat size your sequence length and the number of heads and then um, what was C C is the hidden dimension and yeah so right so because you divide your hidden dimension by the number of heads that's why this factor and then finally we transpose uh, these two dimensions um, so ultimately we get B times number of heads times the sequence length times the hidden dimension. Um, right. Uh, this is, you know, uh, uh, I guess useful for caching. Um, now, if you have rotatory embedding, you just apply the rotatory embedding you know, by multiplying that with that R matrix. And then you just apply QKV. And then finally, what you have to do is um, because you computed for all all the number of heads you need to transpose and combine concatenate all the heads so that is why the contiguous and the view that that pretty much computes your attention um, and this what was this method uh yes just a final linear layer um okay yeah so hmm, interesting that this feed forward out is not part of it oh i see i mean that is this is just a feed forward inside their tension now um so this is just a tension now we look at the forward which is not implemented because we will do it a different way so let's let's look at it. So this block has it's so this is this will be the base class for it, all the different kinds of transformer implementations. Um, okay, or rather attention block implementations. So in the sequential one, where um, the output is, we will compute attention, um, add uh, the residual, apply layer norm, and then an MLP. So um, you have your standard definitions in the init. Apart from all the initializations of the base class, uh, you, you initialize parameters a certain way. And then in the forward, we do um, so if that if there's an activation function, we first um, the attention projection right so we apply the mlp to ah okay so right 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 um let me think activation checkpoint function is not none let's um, forget about what activation is doing but what we are doing is we have a layer norm and then we have the projection so given an x we apply a layer norm and then uh the forward so so we apply the layer norm so we, we just we are just applying this function and where did it go and 
Oh, I just realized um, this is even simpler than I thought. So yes, so you apply the the activation and then you apply the this fully connected layer, which literally just computes the QKV matrices. So basically you get, it's a single fully connected layer that generates all your QKV. Um, once you have your QKV, you apply a tension. Um, so you take a different pathway if you're a tension checkpointing, you're rather activation checkpointing, but um, then you apply the residuals and then you apply feed forward in different variations. So your standard um, lock up post attention, you have the different feed forwards, dropouts, fan in, fan out. So so this this is your standard um, network stuff. Nothing nothing too too crazy here. Um, so again we get the attention scores, apply dropout, do the residual. Um, and then um, we apply the feed forward norm, then the projection, then we apply the activation at uh, the silo one. Again, a feed forward, a dropout, and then another residual. So let's uh, let's go back and see like basically what we are doing. Uh, let's see if I can pull an image off. Um, so this it could be that that's the difference whether you have a pre norm or a, so so you take the input. RMS norm, that's your pre-norm, you do an attention, and um, then again, that's where this, the, you added the results back in, another pre-norm, MLP, and another, like, addition. Um, let me see if I can find the whole llama blocks. Um, so this, the, this was just the attention block, then there is the silo block. Uh, the thing. Uh, self-explanatory okay so for llama um, yeah so for llama um, we again inherit from this big Olmo block so what we just looked at was a sequential block for llama it um is similar but has some different implementation to imitate behavior of llama um yeah so i, I don't think i want to go through the details of this could be a pre-norm post-norm thing but um and the silo thing so the basic idea is the same um okay so so i think we're mostly done now we've done the big blocks now um now we're looking at uh the groups so what they're trying to do is um what they would do is they will bunch together a bunch of um groups of all more blocks so um so so these this block this kind of attention block will be grouped together i guess that that's my guess if i look at the forward pass um they just um bunch together oh yeah it's a module list yes so it's a bunch of all more blocks that that's pretty much it and if forward pass that just goes through it so that that's um i think that that's all that is and then you you're different so each of these blocks has its own uh, activation checkpointing thing um finally let's see what this is uh, let me just see if there's anything else uh, no that's the last thing finally 
this is the big one this is going to be a big one this is the actual model class that you will instantiate which will take into account all the different blocks that you did so it has all this configuration about what you want your bedding size for cap size all the blah 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 um so i'm not sure if it's enabled by default but you always want to enable flash attention if your uh system supports it because that is really fast um there are all sorts of checks when things should be divisible by other things um, um then we just have our embedding layer the 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 really um parting points of entry into the model then we build the almost blocks um these are just your attention layers um and then we have our final output layers now the e the, there is a thing of initializing device uh, meta which i think i will touch let me start looking into configuration but this is what you use for fsdp when you're doing distributed setting like what is your initial device and it's not a single device it's just a meta device which kind of um, you, you set it to be meta and the system takes care of like how the distribution so uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later that's why the device is meta um, then uh, some bunch of logic of how you reset parameters and then the forward pass so what does forward take? It takes an input IDs, then or handling embeddings, attentions, and uh, good output, hidden states. Um, it pretty much starts with the uh, your embeddings, and um, we basically go through the. We will probably go through the whole block. There should be some for loop somewhere where we go over the entire um yep yep so so we basically go over all the blocks now the interesting thing is um there is an if condition um where either we apply blocks one by one or we apply this block group size um, I'm not completely sure how this works. Could be something to do with um, uh, this this distributed training and checkpointing and so on. So okay, I think I think I I I think I understand like what's going on here. So you can keep things granular, like where uh, you just your block your group is just one block. Or you can keep things your group is multiple blocks like a group is made of like two or three blocks together two or three layers together um, how this helps is when you shard in fsdp you can you will shard it at a group level so the finer you are the finer you can shard your model the coarser you are the more layers you pack together in a single shard uh, that, that's that's where um, this that's what this logic is for um, yeah so yeah that, that's why all this caching across the book, uh, blocks then all the standard stuff and, and finally you get your outputs that seems to be it i don't think i'll, I'll discuss this wrap policy but i don't see any other thing um yeah, I don't see any other thing. So let me just check for if they do any loss computation here. No, no. In the model class, they don't. They keep it neat and simple, and they don't do any loss computation. So I think at this point we have we have we are done with reviewing what the model looks like, or how they've implemented the model. Everything was pretty straightforward. Like it was simple Python code, nothing fancy. Uh, that's the beauty of using something like um, FSDP or DeepSpeed, where you can keep your model as is and um deep speed and fsdp will go in and do the heavy lifting of sharding your model 
how um on the contrary in megatron you have to build or write your model with parallelism in mind so you have to think about tensor parallelism you, when you write a, a fully connected layer you will need to split it into column parallel and row parallel bits and um and that's why you know megatron or something like megatron is used for the really large uh training but um fsdb is good enough for 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 what what um uh, we want to do okay so the last thing i want to talk about was this sharding uh policy so yes uh, let's Uh, so we talked about the forward, and now the not sharding, but the wrapping policy. So in FSDP, you need, you have to define um, the block or the layer type or the class that you want to shard, and um, that's that's what this function basically does. Um, and uh, in this code, they support couple of strategies um, which they define somewhere whether you want to shard things by block um, by block and size by block group by block group and size so I will only go over the block one they loop over the model and they find that if anything that's an instance of an all the all block class basically the transformer layer you wrap it so you wrap that into FSDP. So that's pretty much the logic behind it. Um, they also have like one and two, one and three, one and four. And um, to understand what's going on with these, let's go to this config file, which defines the types of all the configs. And if I go to FSDP, um let's the right so here fsdb wrapping strategy by block means wrap each almo block by its own fsdb instance by block and size um it's like by block but wte and ff um the fully connected layers output will be wrapped separately um if by block I, we have to check what's happening to the fully connected layers um and fully connected layers out because um i'm not sure what happens to the layers that you do not wrap let's let's ask um if i can ask um chat GPT or Okay. Let me help. Let me ask ChatGPT, and we can just Google it. Got it. So basically, I think what's going to happen is a non-wrap layer is going to be present on all the devices. Uh, the sharded layers are the ones that are sh sharded. Uh, the non-wrap layers um, will remain as is, which is fine because. Um, and the, the, the remaining ones are just the embedding layers. Although they're bulky, I think that's fine. Um, so that is it. This one and two and one and three, I do not know what this is. Oh, okay. So basically one and two and one and three are basically the checkpoint after every two layers, three, four, and one. Um, so kind of don't, don't care about this. Uh, let's go back to the model class. Um, so let's 
let's look at the so by block what right so um for block we are only doing dolma blocks for um for by block and size we also do um the feed forward networks and um the embedding matrix rather okay i think i think that that makes sense um there are some kind of interesting functions to compute the flops um this is a generation function and uh, how do you load something from checkpoint and um some other helpful methods so i think this this covers the whole implementation of Olmo. um and We've already taken 40 minutes and I haven't even like uh, gone into details of what everything is doing, but I don't think that was the point. I'm sure there are like plenty of videos about details of each of these available on YouTube. I just wanted to sh run, do a code walkthrough of an actual pre-training LLM code. Um, so at this point, we've gone through the model implementation. The next time we will go over how the training works, which is where all this distributed stuff will come in. But yeah, I think that is it for this video. Thanks for watching.